All right. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Well, welcome to day two of Practical Farmers in-person conference. Woo! It's so great to be here with you all. Um, some quick announcements before we start our day. I want to remind you of some of our great conference features. Um, first of all, the many exhibitors. Um, this is our first time back in a while, as you know, and over 70 exhibitors are here. So they're excited to be with you and talk with you. So just make sure you stop by and say hi. We have the All Iowa Lunch at noon, followed by PFI Storytelling. So make sure you check that out. The silent auction of PFI Experiences will close at 4 p.m. And then also be sure to check out PFI Faces um, on the top floor. So it's a great way to meet new people if you haven't and learn some fun facts about other members. We'll be together here for 60 minutes, followed by a 30 minute break before the next session beginning. If you're a certified crop advisor, you can sign up for your CEU credits back at that left table. Um, just a quick note on civility, a reminder that we're a diverse group representing many perspectives. Let's be respectful so we can uphold PFI's core value of this being a place for everyone to learn. Um, there's an evaluation form on page 39, so just make sure you're cognizant of that throughout your sessions and filling those out. We read every single one and we take your words to heart to inform our programming. And once again, thank you for your cooperation with masks. <laughs> So for the topic of the hour, Jason Mock is the CEO of Muncie Meats and also farms corn, beans, wheat, and wean to finish pigs in Indiana. And Zach Smith farms corn and soybeans with Iowa and implements cover crops and livestock into his rotation. And together, they're using innovation to benefit the landscape and create economic opportunities. So let's give them a warm welcome. Thank you. You hear me okay? Good deal. So first, give yourself a pat on the back because you've made the choice to not you know, just think about management here. Uh, the difference between kind of being a leader is just giving yourself the permission to fail. Uh, and I think me and Zach have kind of chose to take part of our time to give ourselves the permission to try different things and fail. And that's really, when you, when you break it down, that's the only way we really learn. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of share my story and kind of the, the progression and the evolution of, of kind of both of our backgrounds and how we got together and kind of the greater vision moving forward of connecting with the consumer, getting that customer on each acre that we farm and trying to create an opportunity for new people in the agriculture. And Zach will talk about that where you know, we're getting to where one person can manage over a thousand acres you know, can we get a thousand people on an acre? That would be a little extreme, but we went, where'd we go yesterday? They had 300 employees for the, the agritourism. Center Grove. Center Grove, I mean, that's an amazing place. And I think we can do, you know, iterations of that our own farm. So my background, you know, uh, I graduated in 1999, last class. And my mom told me, you got to go get a, a job in town. There's just no room for, to farm. You know, corn was a dollar eighty. Beans were in the fours. And I went to school, got a marketing degree, started selling, and, and, and I wanted to get my hands dirty, so I started a landscape business in Muncie, Indiana, similar town to Ames. And I, that, that really changed my lens when I came back to the farm after doing this for six or eight years in town. And, and I, I got to, to design things. And I call these living billboards. And I would do this in front of businesses to, to create curb appeal and a perception that that business was a nice place to stop. So I see shapes and colors and sizes, and you see this. I've got a lot of different plant species here. So when I came back to the farm and everything was blank slate, one thing, it just really didn't make much sense to me. So about 2013 was the first time I put strips in wheat. And I had a wet year, it didn't, it didn't I, I wasn't able to follow that through. But in 2015, I put my first relay crop, and this last year was my sixth relay crop. And it's kind of evolved uh, through trial and error and observation. And where I really found value in this system was, and I didn't really know the word until I, I've talked to people, uh, John Kemp came up with this idea, or it's not an idea, it's epigenetics. It's just the fact that everything in nature is a product of its environment. And by creating different venues, then we can change uh, the way that a seed or an animal or a person evolves and grows based on the environment that we create. 
So uh, this system, I started on 30 inch wheat. We went to 60 inch wheat in these wide rows. And it was really neat watching this evolve from, from, from stretching that out. Look, look what happens here in just you know, four weeks. That plant is allowed to, to grow out and we can get two entities on an acre of land instead of just one. But the, but the interesting thing um, about the agronomy, when you look at the mathematics, what I, I kind of figured out through trial and error, you know, we're told these manage, management prescriptions, hey, you've got to plant 32,000 corn plants. And a lot of people assume that if I plant half the corn plants, I'm going to get half the yield. Well, that's not the case at all, because what's relevant is the amount of sunlight, the nutrients, the CO2 in the, in the atmosphere. And we can really start lever leveraging plants and arranging things. And, and what, why I became interested in putting animals in that space is because no matter what we do and arrange things, something's going to get hurt. Something is going to get inflected. And these little chickens right here are a very easy transaction. You know, $20 a piece. I can give someone a chicken. And... Uh, after you know four or five years, I became bored on this. Uh, so starting to started to think about animals, and that's how me and Zach connected with his uh, stock cropper concept. So I'm going to turn it over to Zach here, go into his stock cropper, and then we'll come back to uh, how we actually put these products in the marketplace. All right, can you hear me th good through the through the face shield here? Okay, so um, <clears throat> my name is Zach Smith, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I got to present uh, via Zoom uh, last year uh, at PFI, so I'm going to try not to be too redundant if you've seen my talk, but give you a little bit of what I've been working on. Uh, Jason and I uh, have known each other for the last few years, and when he was getting into the idea of running chicken tractors through on the last slide you saw, uh, we came up with this idea of having not just one species of livestock but multiple species of livestock training through um, fields of corn and so that's what i'm going to uh, to talk a little bit about uh, that system to give you an overview and then some of the unique things from a marketing standpoint uh, some ideas that i've had kind of outside the box so i want to first uh, introduce you to myself though uh, my path to stock cropping i was raised on a uh, just a straight corn and soybean farm uh, with farrow to finish hogs till the early 90s uh, straight north of here, about 115 miles, a little town called Buffalo Center, uh, Iowa. And I uh, came to the great uh, university here in town, uh, Iowa State. I graduated with a BS in agronomy in the uh, sort of winter of 2002. And then essentially for the last uh, 15 to 20 years, I've been in what people would, I guess, uh, ascribe to the, uh, the big ag space. So I sold crop protection products for a large independent chemical retailer for, I think, about 11 or 12 years. And then for the last six years, uh, I had my own um, retail business where I was a pioneer seed dealer, sold chemical, fertility recommendations, uh, kind of everything that you would see in conventional agriculture. Uh, that was what I was a part of. Uh, that was up until about six months ago when I made the decision that at 42 years old, I was kind of in this mid midlife crisis around agriculture and seeing the direction that it was going. And I wanted to walk away and focus more on uh, my farm operation and this concept uh, that I'd been working on for the last two years uh, called the stock cropper. And the biggest reason is this slide here, and I share this with most of the presentations I do. I call it uh, the, the funnel of consolidation with, with ag. And so for the last you know, 100 to 150 years, we started off with a lot of people participating in this business. And every year, it just seems to be getting fewer and fewer with the idea that if you, uh, if you succeed and really strive just to pick up acres or more you know, hog barns, uh, that is the that's the key to success and uh, you know when I, I'll admit when I was a young man in this business uh, I wanted to be big too um, but the older I got and saw the impact it was having uh, on the communities and the rural landscapes and, and the ecosystems and the you know the negative impacts it's very difficult to farm at scale in my opinion uh, and and do things that are good for uh, for the soil and the water and the community and so uh, and I wasn't interested in being one of the four people left you know, with the model of, you know, farming, uh, you know, tens of thousands of acres uh, in a county and not having anybody else around uh, in a community to be with. And so it was really that uh, kind of mindset along with the fact two years ago corn was $3 a bushel, it wasn't six like it is today, 
uh, that a couple uh, of other farmers, uh, a guy by the name of Sheldon Stevever and Lance Peterson, we were brainstorming on an idea of how could we flip this system and do something that was more ecologically based to build community, and that's how we came up with this concept called uh, stock cropping. And so really, stock cropping in one sentence is uh, just the reintersection of livestock and row crops back on the field at the same time. And uh, it's what, you know, this picture uh, shows it uh, really quite well. So this is our, uh, we had to, in order to do this, we had to design a mobile livestock barn that would house multiple species and support multiple species of, of livestock, basically to do the opposite of what you see when you drive in Ames, which is just fields surrounded with monocrops of corn and soybeans and, and CAFOs. We wanted to re-intertwine uh, you know, both plants and animals back and move them in a really deliberate uh, discipline stance uh, through, through the field and have a lot more biodiversity than what we have in our normal farming systems and something that would be self-sufficient, so, uh, that would form a closed loop system where the animals are there to feed the plants and the plants are there to feed the animals, something that could actually enhance our soil quality, something that could actually you know, put manure on in a way to build soil where it isn't a risk to running off into a growing cover crop that's going to recover and take those nutrients up. And most importantly, uh, get away from what we were dealing with was just selling commodities uh, well below the cost of production. We wanted to produce something where we walk the value off the farm in a non-commodity form where we can actually make some money and potentially flip that funnel that I had on this page upside down and start to get more people back on the landscape rather than just, uh, than just a few. So that's really uh, the, the kind of the premise that two years ago, uh, about this time, right before the pandemic hit, that this idea was, uh, was launched. So this is a, a picture of the first test site that we have. So we call our, uh, our stock cropper barns the cluster clucks because it's kind of a four ring animal circus on wheels. And so we could, this version we called the cluster cluck 5000 and we had sheep and uh, goats up front in the front pen uh, that would go off to the right and have shelter on the right side of the barn. On the back side, uh, we had the pigs go out and then behind we had two uh, salad and style chicken tractors that we advanced behind. So this system was designed to move 11 feet uh, once or twice a day. And the first year uh, we had uh, an electric winch that we had uh, on the back of this tractor to move it through these uh, lanes of annual pasture. And then we planted corn in between and really got a lot of benefit uh, for the corn crop as well. If you're familiar with the uh, strip intercropping practice, you can really get an enhancement in, and actually have uh, higher corn yields from giving the, the veins of air movement and increased light, uh, which Jason has got uh, on the whiteboard here um, as well. So the idea really in this system is that it's a perfect loop where we put, run the animals through one year and the next year we rotate and put the crops in that space. So we reduce the need for inputs, uh, hopefully cut down you know, on uh, weed control costs uh, significantly and always keep a living root growing in, this, in, the, in, the, uh, in the soil, which is completely different from what 95% of Iowa agriculture has in it right now. So that was our 2020 site. This is our 2021 site where we actually expanded things out. And we, uh, the, really the goal in 2021 that we had was we wanted to uh, build different iterations and widths and come up with different lives or species uh, mixes. So the barn over on the far right was the big boy. That was the max, the cluster cluck max nine. That was a 30 foot width and we'd got comments. Well, what about introducing cattle? So we put a couple uh, 350 pound calves and started them in and they were our lawnmower grazer in the front. And then we had some Berkshire hogs in the back of that system. And then we had the, the cluster cluck 5,000 that you saw from 2020 in the middle. And then we made a little homemade uh, 10 foot version for 120 inch lanes. And so the idea with this, it, with the 2021 site is different species, different pasture seeding timings and mixes. Uh, and then we wanted to look at the, the possibility of different ro uh, row crop mixes to actually feed the, uh, uh, the animals the next year. So the idea with what we're trying to do is can we grow the corn and soybeans right next door that we could potentially take into the yard and process ourselves, turn back into animal feed or other mixes like uh, uh, barley and field peas. So we tried to do a barley field pea mixture in one of the lanes this year to, uh, to experiment with that. We weren't successful uh, with that, but I think if we had the right uh, equipment, I think we could have a better chance of trying to pull that off. But we experimented with a lot of different things. You can see there's 60 and 90 inch corn off to, to the side 
Uh, but we moved these barns through this site uh, either uh, at least twice or sometimes three times a day with manual uh, means. But the thing I learned about this year is that it's fine to do things manually, but really uh, if, if this is something that's gonna scale in the future, we've gotta have the ability for um, autonomous movement so that you're not out there yanking barns uh, around all the time. But really the concept that makes stock cropping work is this idea of enterprise stacking where uh, instead of just having a single pen of chickens going between 60 inch corn, the ability to have multiple entities uh, that are giving benefit not just from an economic standpoint com contributing to the bottom line but from an ecological standpoint too with having different you know, uh, gut biomes producing manure and, uh, and going back onto the land helping you diversify risk, feeding the soil, and then having that, that story of diversity and walking um, you know, non-commodity protein off the farm. So this is kind of the, the evolution of what we've had for uh, designs in the barns, the 5,000, the Max 9, and then uh, formed a partnership a little over, or about a year ago with Dawn Equipment. Some of you might be familiar with them. And they helped produce uh, this, the first truly uh, autonomous version of uh, this technology, which we call the Cluster Cluck Nano. And this is actually at Jason's uh, uh, Jason Mock's um, field day in uh, July where we debuted that version. So this version that you see on this uh, stage is uh, it's got solar power, electric uh, advancement, and we drove it actually with an Xbox controller as far as wireless being able to, uh, to steer and demonstrate. So this is 120 inch sweet corn that he had uh, planted. Um, so this is a, a video of what the thing looked like when we finally got it working uh, well as a demonstration so you can kind of see uh, how it how this is a time lapse so it's designed it kind of looks like a frog or it sits here for a little bit but it'll take off so the barn would lift itself move ahead eight feet at a time and you see the lift there it sets itself back down and we had some chickens to demonstrate we shot some content of this in uh, in December here but the idea is is that if you have something you know that can move on its own you can have pre-programmed uh, things on an iPhone for it to, uh, to advance, you know, because the thing is, is that as the animals get bigger, they need to be advanced more. And so there's, there's definitely a, a curve that you're going to have to have the ability to, if, if this is going to scale out, to have something uh, autonomously moving them through. You're still going to require a person. We're not trying to get rid of people, because uh, you're still going to have to have somebody come out and chore and feed and uh, add feed and water uh, to the barns themselves. But the autonomous advancement uh, and getting that figured out is going to be essential for us scaling this forward here. So the, the future cluster cluck applications I see is anywhere where there's a confined channel uh, in space needing livestock. So not only like you know corn and soybean fields like what I developed it uh, for on my own operation, but also acreages and backyards and things like solar arrays where we've got pa solar panels uh, where we could run a cluster cluck uh, in between those and have you know the goats work out underneath uh, the panels, and uh, but but yet some you know keep them confined. And that's you know that's one of the key things with uh, with this is having a system where it actually keeps the animals in. And that's one thing that you know in two years of doing this, we haven't had a single animal escape uh, with the, the barns that we've designed or had any losses uh, to predation with having a setup that actually has hard fencing uh, as part of the solution. So these are just. Uh, a couple other pictures uh, from over the, the year that I thought I'd throw in and talk a little bit about. This is actually combining the, uh, the high population corn that you can see. Um, and you can see the recovery of the pasture on the left in the fall time after the animals had gone through and taken up that manure. This is a picture when we launched on the 4th of July here. So I put our uh, American flag out when we launched the, uh, the Max 9. and. The calves that we had in that, and our Berkshire hogs that were in the back of that. Goats and sheep, and that's my beautiful hemp gilt. She was glorious. And then another picture from the, from, kind of from the ground level here of, you can see the system with you know, the height of the sorghum sedan grass and the different mixes. So we, we were trying to basically get through this every 45 to 50 days and come back and hit. Uh, the idea was that we would hit the pasture strips uh, twice in the same year. So, how does this scale? Um, I get this question in every interview or podcast or anything, I, I sit down with somebody. I think the, uh, the actual equipment, especially with the partnership with Don, um, is, uh, is going to get there pretty quick. Probably within the next year or two, we're gonna have the systems figured out that we could stock crop across an acre 
or an 80 acre field if we wanted to and put 20 or 30 of these things out to, to parade across the land. But the issue is the processing piece. And so the title of this you know, meeting session is Unique Marketing uh, Opportunities um, on How to Move This Thing Forward. And so what I wanted to talk a little bit about was an alternative path or vision. This isn't, you know, admittedly, this isn't going to be a solution that is going to be a mass, you know, a massive scale piece, but I think it's still it's something important that I've seen over the last about dozen years of my life. And that is getting more people in touch with becoming, or consumers becoming processors themselves, like what my family has done. So when my girls were little, I wanted them to have the ability to, uh, to know where their food came from and be a part of that. And so we bought some broiler chickens and uh, you can see that they were in charge of doing the chores and I would make them actually come out and they would butcher. So it, that's my daughter, Eleanor, uh, holding the chicken up and that she would actually pull the, the chicken hearts out and stick her, uh, stick her arm in to help eviscerate it at a young age. And it was good because I knew that if they could do it at a young age, if uh, boys ever crossed them now, they're teenagers, uh, it'd be a good uh, defense mechanism. And it has worked out pretty well there. <laughs> so uh, that evolved into about 10 years ago, uh, I had a buddy that wanted to uh, butcher a pig. And I didn't know anything about butchering pigs. And so he's like, well, I'd like to raise it outside and, uh, and, then, and then cut it up. And so I said, well, okay, we'll throw a space. So we, we did that and threw it out there. And we had a book and we hung the pig up and had our knives and kind of stumbled through it the first time. But it was really fun and we, we uh, you know, got used to it and uh, told some other people what we did. And the next year we had a couple people that want us to or, you know, have us grow up some pigs for them. And then they wanted to participate in the butchery. And so over the next three or four years, we built kind of this tradition that the weekend before Thanksgiving, a collection of us would get together and we'd butcher six to eight pigs and make a whole weekend out of it. And this picture over here on the, on the right is, uh, is uh, I think this was about five or six years ago, of, of our crew uh, gutting pigs in my garage. And, you know, it's really developed into a wonderful tradition when I talk about community and people coming together and doing tangible things. Uh, this is a picture, we actually do this on the north side of Ames now at my buddy's place, but uh, it's just, you know, there's not as many traditions. People used to do this stuff all the time, and I think especially after what's happened in our society from the last couple of years with the pandemic and living on Zoom and, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's idea of putting Oculus on to live in virtual reality, which to me is more annoying than wearing a, a face shield up here. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, there's just, there's such a detachment from reality and, you know, store shelves going bare that I think people are hungry for real experiences, doing real things that can solve a real issue. And so one of the things that I'm really passionate about is coming up with venues that connect people more with understanding how to actually process their own stuff or setting up venues where people can come and learn and then potentially maybe down the road, like my vision with stock cropper is the idea that we could have animals that you could see from start to finish. And if people had the, you know, if they could come to say a training center where you could teach them how to do butchery and they get to the point where they're confident enough that then you could deliver, you could go around North Ames or, you know, uh, Waukee or, or, you know, any of the suburban areas and with a truck that you would drop off half hogs on Saturday mornings for butcher parties in neighborhoods and have people come together and actually you know, work together to make meat like what we've had and establish um, relationships through food. And so that's something, it's like I said, it's not a widespread scaled solution, but I think it's something that we've done and we've had a lot of interest that people have wanted to participate. And so I wanted to kind of share that story a little bit with the system that I've been working on here uh, myself. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jason and he can talk about some of the solutions that he's working with Muncie Meats on trying to find solutions to the scaling of this. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. So the question is, uh, are the mobile pens limited to flat land? Uh, our hope is no, but right now we're in the, we're in the phases of uh, reconnoitering our drive systems and we're trying to put the autonomous steering systems on actually this month and doing some testing but we you know for a lot of the venues that I want to be on they need to be in areas that have slope and you got to have torque uh, and control to be able to do that and that's our intention 
It's going to work easiest right now because I had a lot of flat land in northern Iowa. That's what it is. But I'm fully aware that we've got to design it to have those solutions. So, yes, back there. How do you water the animals? So the question is, how do I water the animals? So we on the uh, the slide, if you go back, Jason, maybe all the way to the first first yeah right there. So you can see there's water tanks. Uh, we had 110 gallons of carrying capacity, which depending on how hot it was, would get us two or three days. What's that? Oh, yeah. And then we, uh, the other thing that we had built in the, the original barns is you can see that there's an inverted roof that we could be able to c uh, capture rainwater with. So an inch of rain would give us 110 gallons. Now, last year in the drought, it didn't work very well for us, so we'd have to take water out. So I had a, a UTV with a 250-gallon cage tank with a pump, and we would ho have a quick banjo hookup. You know, every couple days, we'd have to fill that up and uh, so that the animals would have, uh, have water. And so that's the thing, it's, you know, it's not going to be something that you're going to fill up and walk away from for two weeks because you still need to be out checking your animals. So, you know, every two days, figure feed and water to bring out and the barns are set up for that capacity. Yeah, so uh, I've done estimates and built a model out to scale that, and I've got it to 80 acres. To, that's what I've got in my head. So on 80 acres, uh, if we had the 20-foot the version, uh, I think that would require, I think it was about uh, 29 or 30 barns. Uh, and so the idea would be, I think, at the stocking rates I had, it would be somewhere between 350 pigs uh, that would be produced off 80 acres. And, and assuming that, you know, that's only, you know, roughly a half or third of the actual because you've got to have alleys for turning the things around and you can maybe graze cattle in those spots. So you would have to have a way to turn them when you get to the end. Yeah. And so yeah, you would have lanes that you would have to either make hay with or, you know, if, it, probably the easiest way to bring cattle into the system would be on the laneways and that was always the, Thank I don't think the, the cattle, I did the cattle more for an experiment to see. I think there's other technologies that are probably better for cattle than what I'm doing. And then why did barley and peas fail? I didn't plant them deep enough and it didn't rain. And uh, I'm hoping that next year that we can, uh, we can do a better. My drill was not sufficient at getting the, the peas punched in deep enough and they gave up and quit. So. It depends on, on what, so the question was, is 20 feet the I ideal uh, for, for strips? I think if you're going to try to do a scaled, like an 80 acre field, I think 20, or the 20 foot machine is probably going to be it. But I'm really interested, um, at least initially, with getting the, the project off the ground at targeting smaller versions that could go on acreages or vineyards or orchards or you know places where people could maybe want to grow their own animals and then take it to their own processor or butcher themselves. Um, and, uh, and then blow up to, you know, eventually when we learn more, the, uh, the broader acre field. So. And there'll be many iterations, but if, if we're trying to grow organic corn, maybe we want a single row and really push the population so, so the animals do all the work, basically, right. through that movement. So the question is, am I growing all the cover crop at the same time? Uh, so the pasture mixes, no, they get seeded at different times, and there's different mixes specific to when we're going to be on. So I've got... You know, I know how many pasture moves we're going to make, and so you know, for the first 45 days, we'll have this mix, and then we'll go more to a, a summer annual mix after that, and then yeah, we we vary it at different planning planning dates and timings. The limitless imagination, if you know, we're, we're producing excess power with the nano, so you know, we're not there yet, but you may have a, a you know a small autonomous tractor that is is planting cover crops and and creating you know all these different algorithms and time and space. Of where that's going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's a risk, but I, from a regulation standpoint, if people are participating directly and uh, they're taking whole and half animals, there's a lower barrier of entry uh, from a regulatory you know, standpoint to, uh, to, to get into it. You know, I, we've been doing it on our own and, uh, you know, for 10 or 11 years and we have not had, I mean, when we started it was pretty, uh, um, 
pretty archaic uh, situation we did. We've never once had a single issue with anyone ever getting uh, getting saved. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't you shouldn't be careful or, or be concerned or want to set up venues. I mean, that's definitely got to be part of if you're going to include the general public. But uh, you know, I think you you know from a regulatory standpoint, like with the state of Iowa, when I looked into it, I think you could start one of these centers and just be a, a custom exempt. Um, shop you wouldn't have to be USDA inspected or anything like that in order if, if you were selling whole and half animals directly to consumers so yep. cool. yeah so I, I had a very similar kind of midlife crisis as uh, <laughs> Zach you don't you really talk about it out loud but you know when I was doing the commodity stuff we have Tyson pigs I you know it was neat but I didn't really have anything I could sell or connect with. So when COVID came around, we were seeing the, the empty shelves. We were seeing the Chicago Board of Trade price was the lowest it's ever been, but they're wanting you know, 10 pound or $10 a pound for hamburger. And we were fortunate enough to connect uh, with a man that's been at Muncie Meats. Muncie Meats has been there since 1957, but he started working there in high school. He was near, nearly 70 years old. All the restaurants that he was, not all the restaurants, but most of them were closed and he didn't really want to rough it out the next few years through, uh, you know, a lot of unseen circumstances that was going to be ahead. So we bought Muncie Meats at the time, had five employees. We now have 26. And my big strategy is to go completely vertically integrated, to be a facilitator for people like Zach. They're trying to create their own brand and create more value in the marketplace. So. This really hinged on relationships. And this is Sean Stetson right here. Uh, he was just graduating college. He won the Entrepreneur uh, Award for Ball State University. And his project was having a meat shop. But he was a manager at Lahoti's Meats uh, for two years, had worked there four years, was great with customers, knew his way around uh, butchers, and he had a lot of friends. And uh, he attracted those friends, and we've created a culture and I think part of our culture is not only how we manage and, and give them the ability to uh, take responsibility instead of look over them, uh, but also some of the, the, the programs we're doing with the community. So initially, everything was closed, so we, had to, we actually took this old truck. We had seven trucks when we bought the business. We took it to Rural King, and we bought shelving, and we put shelves in there, and we just we went on the highway. And it was unreal. I wasn't prepared. Imagine that. I didn't know how to work a credit card machine. And I had 30 people lined up right when I opened. And I was sweating. It was July. I called everybody I knew. And we ended up selling about $8,000 worth of meat that day. And uh, it was pretty incredible. Um, and this is how uh, our truck will look. But this is kind of how I've created this vertically integrated system. Uh, we don't have a harvest facility at Muncie Meats. So we started really going around the state inspected place, the custom places, getting to know everyone. And we made two solid connections. And we helped those people get their USDA certification, which is a lot of paperwork. But there have been a lot of grants to help out on the equipment side. And we kind of used some knowledge from my seed corn uh, days. And we use these smart boxes. And we will uh, quarter those cows into cuts and take that back to Muncie Meat. So that's how we. We do that. These are our pigs in the woods that we took back to Muncie Meats, and uh, we take that truck around. So as the COVID started to calm down a little bit, the restaurants started opening up, we wanted to change our business model from 100% restaurant supplier to a 50-50 model, and, and perhaps you know, well beyond that on the, on the consumer space. So we needed to find ways to get in front of more people. And this is an AFM, and this is just a glorified big refrigerator. And the way this thing works is we created an e-commerce site at Muncie Meats where people can get on, get, get their bacon, their steaks, their eggs, whatever. And then we put it in this machine, and then we hit OK. And this thing up top will send a text message and email to our customers and says, your package has arrived. And then they just come out. They open up a QR code right on their text message, go up to the screen here. It opens the door. They get their stuff. They don't have to get the kids out of the car. They can literally pull right up to it. And this takes 20 seconds. And this is something that we want to scale into larger metropolitan areas in the years to come. 
there's a lot of work designing these systems, how they'll work. But quite frankly, this has been the driver of our marketing at Muncie Meats. And I got this idea from Happy Gilmore when he had to save his grandma. Uh, he would put these big checks in his truck. And we created an automated fundraiser system. And the way it works, a really quick conversation with our marketing guy. We're working with schools, churches, primarily sports teams, organizations. And we can have 5, 10, 15, 50, 100 of these going on at the exact same time. The, the, the organization will send a hyperlink out that sends them to a, uh, a site. They choose uh, you know, two to four different options in a box. We show up with our big truck and we give that away in, a, in an hour or two hour window. But the beautiful thing about it is not only are we marketing through the Facebook algorithm because we'll get tons of shares every time we do this, and we usually are sending out checks two, three, four times a week, but also we're, we're working with people that would not have ever considered using Muncie Meats. They're just wanting to participate and help you know, the, the, the baseball team buy gloves or something like that. So they become aware of Muncie Meats through our e-commerce website, they have to use it. So if I can get 100 people to participate on a fundraiser, I might get five or 10 to try it again. And I might get two or three people to be a, kind of a customer for life. And when you start thinking about what is a customer for life if they get all their meat, is that 20, 30, 40, 50 bucks a week? How much is that up for a year? And if you can enroll, constantly enroll three, four, five people to be you know, constant customers, it really starts to add up if you really start pushing that every day. And that's been kind of what we're, we've been doing. And it's kind of created a framework to be able to experiment and do other things. Really interesting thing here, we put a pumpkins out uh, the previous year with the rye and the sweet corn. And because we uh, kind of broke bluegrass, there was no disease in the pumpkins and they just went crazy. We had four acres of pumpkins. It was insane how many pumpkins were out there and we couldn't get rid of them and, and we're getting into mid to late October. So we just turned it into a fundraiser. Instead of sitting up there and, and defending that pumpkin saying it's six bucks, you know, this one's eight bucks or 10 bucks. We, we just donated all the revenue to the school and people would happily donate 20, 30, 50 bucks. And they raised $2,500 in two hours. And we worked with several schools. And also, you know, if you look at it from a reductionist standpoint, the, the, the outreach that you can create and the, you know, the value created on that pumpkin patch was well over $10,000 for something that we rent for $100 an acre. And uh, you know, a lot of relationships happen from that. So we built, built retail space. The other thing I'm passionate about, you know, it seems like there's either a Dollar General or Casey's in every small town. But there's not a lot of real, you know, local entrepreneurs left. So we really try to find those local entrepreneurs. This is Dick Johnson. He owns a gas station in town. He owns a gas station just north of me. Both towns are less than a thousand people. We're in seven really small towns with our, with our high quality proteins to give them an option other than Funyuns and, and bologna that they could get at the DG. Uh, so that's helped. And then kind of all these ideas, I needed a place to do it all. And that's, that's really the dream going forth. We purchased a 200 acre property just north of Indianapolis off the interstate. We're gonna feature five of Zach's stock croppers next year. And we're going to create all these different iterations, different uh, perennial food crops, annuals, demonstrate the closed loop system, and uh, really just imagine what we could do. We'll have a, a large campground here, so we have a large captive audience, sports fields, and uh, really change the structure of how we do business is what I'm interested in. And I want to tell this story real quick. This is Courtney Moser. She was Miss Basketball, I think, in 2012, went to Purdue. She did the coolest thing. She loves basketball. She lives out in the country in the middle of nowhere. So she, she turned her barn into a little basketball court. So my kids did this this year. There's, a, there's three of them here. She'd usually have three or five people. They would come four days, Monday through Thursday. She had eight different groups of kids come and then she'd get a new group every week. So you think about that, if this was 200 bucks, she's making well over $100,000 is doing what she loves, but giving 
these kids a much more personal experience. So uh, while we were creating this, this uh, property, we've created a, a large uh, area of grass that is, is primarily a golf course, but it'll, it'll layer as a baseball field, as soccer and football fields, as a music venue. We're gonna create an 80-20 revenue share where we can bring in people, talented people that love their craft and create value and we'll, we'll get that complementary effect and just create a lot of different um, scenarios where we can just help the community out. And I think, I just love what Zach's doing. I'm, I really feel like we're on the, uh, the chalkboard and working on the formula that, that there's nothing else that I'd rather work on. So anyway, I'll leave some time for, for Q&A, but that's kind of how we're connected and what we're working on. Yes? So they would get 80% of the revenue. So let's say we have a, you know, a golf course and we have someone working with 10 kids. Um, 20 bucks an hour, they, they keep 16 of it. And, and that just gives us some to uh, help keep. Go ahead. The cluster cluck cost. <laughs> it is a lot of iron, so it's a fair question, a fair point. The stuff that we built uh, here, it's been expensive, uh, but it's all been, um, you know, when you build these things the first time, one of the things we wanted to make sure is it didn't fall apart and it worked, and we, we were really successful with that. Um, so we really never had any issues, any issues other than weight. So the iteration that is getting designed right now in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, by Joe Bass and his team that I've been working with over the past couple months um, is going to be significantly lighter. Uh, so we're targeting somewhere between 1,500 to 2,000 pounds instead of what you saw on the screen moving. That was almost 3,500 pounds. Um, and uh, some of the, the big barn that I built was like probably somewhere between seven, eight thousand 8,000 pounds. So uh, again, we know that that's what it needs to be. And the price points that we have established for those or goals uh, are gonna probably fall, hopefully from a retail standpoint, somewhere between 10 to $15,000, depending on. But we've, uh, you know, everything with, with steel and supply chain stuff and trying to, you know, Right now we're, we're talking about building lots of five to 10. And so from economy of scale, from like just securing motors and, and the things and solar panels, you know, I think we're, we're going to get this, when we start to scale it up, we're gonna get costs driven down and weight and optimization. We know we have to do those things, so. The thing that, that I like to say about stock car, there's a lot of things in this space. You'll see the, the no fence, you'll see the, you know, there's, the, the value proposition for me with a stock cropper is precision grazing and optimizing the sigmoid curve with the vegetation, which creates more organic matter creation and then all the interesting marketing things that you do. But that's, that's really things that you see what all the things that he did on his farm. That's really what we're going to be pushing to find a really uh, a profitable solution on less acres. You know, and the other idea that I didn't talk about, um is the idea of having the capacity for transparency where a consumer could actually subscribe and buy their, their, you know, their piglet in uh, you know, April and then have it from start to finish all the way across with having uh, you know, webcams uh, available in the barn so people could actually see their animal in their barn uh, that they had purchased and, um, and see that all the way through uh, you know, having it end up in their freezer. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And, the, and everything's just for the experience. So it's not a real golf, it's, a, it's three greens, but it only encompasses about five to six acres of turf. Yeah, but you can get a hold of people building a private golf course and say this is the Oh yeah, the all day. And, 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 ball, and, and golf courses are going bankrupt every day yeah. as the industrial jobs have passed and there's just a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead.
Sure. Repeat the question so everybody knows. So you were, you were saying you don't have to be next to a population center necessarily to create a brand? Of direct shipping versus, yeah. well, um, Well, I, I think you're going to get little sprinkles of value all around, but you know Gabe Brown because he, he walks around and speaks, he puts content out, and that's, that's the beginning of everything. It's just <laughs> having the, the uh, what's the word, the, the courage to put your story out there. That's the only way, if you're, if you're going to not live around a population center, uh, to be able to, to build those relationships. Um, but the, but the challenge with shipping is you've got, you've got, you've got the, the dry ice, you've got the box, and then you've got to pay the shipping. So you're 25, 30 bucks, you know, at scale, maybe 16 or 18 before that, that product leaves. Um, so it, it's really going to uh, really target upper, you know, socioeconomic groups. Um, that would be the challenge there, but I don't know. Hopefully I, was there a specific question there that mm -hmm. uh huh Well, the fundraisers aren't necessarily connected, but they, they, they create lists for us and connection points to be aware of our e-commerce platform. Um, so that's where we make all the transactions for the AFM. But we saw, it, it goes exactly with this conversation there. If I've got 20 bucks in the box and the, and the freight and everything to make a transaction, that way lowers my cost. And, the, and also the, the human aspect, we're making humanless transactions and just, just so you know, the, the, the idea as we go forth, our, our meat trucks, we, we service over a thousand restaurants. So we're, we're driving different directions. So we're gonna make many distribution centers with shipping containers where we, we keep a stock for the AFM and then we'll run and cloverleaf AFMs off of that center, a shipping container. Then we can go to Northern Indianapolis. We can start going to Twin Cities, Chicago's and, and put these where we think we can make transactions and, and the dream is to have multiple brands like Zach's. We're doing both. Uh, we just, the, the problem is starting at zero is okay, I gotta make this one 14 miles and I got nothing to share the cost. So we purchased a, uh, well we're, we're kind of collaborating and partnering with a, a home delivery a service that already has 300 stops. What's that now? Uh, it was all organically designed with a firm in town, a, a Widinger. Uh, there wasn't a, I am not the tech guy. I, I come up with the ideas of what I want it to do. And then I make sure it does that. So I, I don't know the ins and outs, but I know it's kind of organically designed to do what we wanted it to do. Well, um, we would like to get more regeneratively raised things in there, but primarily hamburger, uh, hot dog steaks, uh, smoked pork chops, bacon. Uh, we're, we're carrying mi a locally raised milk in those as well. I didn't hear it. What, what, compared to what? With cluster cluck versus what else? Yeah, so I mean, I haven't, I haven't run it through a lab to analyze it. It's just my anecdotal observations. Uh, but when the COVID thing hit, we, we butchered some confinement hogs when, you know, a lot of them were just, uh, uh, you know, being discarded. And 
Uh, that was the first time I'd, I had done, to, per, so personally could see the comparison. And there's a huge difference in, in the appearance of, of the carcass, the color. Uh, you know, Jason saw it, especially with his pigs in the woods. I mean, the darkness of the meat. Some of that comes down to the genetics and the selection of those things. But uh, I've had both. And, uh, uh, and when, I've, when I serve my pork to other people, just like I'm sure a lot of people that do pasture-raised pork in the room already here, uh, there's there's a substantial difference in uh, the, you know the marbling and, and the overall taste, but I've never sent it off to answer your question specifically to have it broke down. So, the the thing that I hate about some of my circumstances is that we still have, you know, my family still derives a lot of value from Tyson hogs. I'm on the on the board of directors of the feed mill. I see the system, but we also sell we sell both products. And we sell a lot of commercial pork, but. As Zach was saying, when we when we got these pigs in the woods brought in the previous year and this year, the the uh, the protein in the in the pork is is just hard and firm, and you put your finger in there, and it's it's just a little softer than this. Where you you hold that pork chop of this, they're not on top of each other. They're getting that that you know I don't know all the reasons. There's a lot less stressful of life. They're eating the, you know, the harvested nuts on the ground floor, and that meat will just literally fall right through your fingers. It's just a completely different uh, texture and flavor. Well, and you have more joy farming this way than going and doing chores yeah. in the barn, too, I think. So. Watching them uh, frolic and be happy is... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. So the question is, is a good one. Uh, how do you background these animals and do you do gestation? Uh, we haven't yet, so everything that we've done, you know, I don't, I don't have my own hog herd or sheep or goats, so I've just bought feeder animals for, from other folks. We did, I guess, keep a couple of the uh, goats and sheep and uh, bred them last year and used them for the project. But one of the really cool things about what we're working on, especially if you're familiar with any of the Prop 12 stuff going on in California, is the, the floor space design uh, of the cluster clucks uh, is sufficient so that we could do like a, a gestation, like a spring farrowing um, in, in the barns uh, for something like that. So that's something I haven't put a ton of time and effort into, but it's been in the back of my mind with watching that stuff happen. So, One thing that, that he didn't have a graphic for, when you consider, you know, as of late, it's been easier to generate $1,000 revenue per acre. And when we're talking about multi-species, you know, we're looking at potentially over $10,000 an acre generated from an acre. And by closing the loop of that system, how complex is that corn or grain that you're taking off the farm? How much transportation does it take to get to the place, processing, distribution? How simple can the transaction be if it's simply the livestock walking off of that farm? And if you were generating $10,000 an acre and lowering your input costs, how much less farm ground do you need? Because it feels like there's this burden that we need to continuously be picking up acres every year to survive to get those economies of scale. And why I'm excited about this is, is the scenario that I think a lot of it has been in when we come out of school and there's really not a room for us on the farm, I think this is a way for the young farmer to buy into something that's actually viable on a 40 or an 80. Mm -hmm. Question? So the question is, how do we ins uh, ins get agriculture incentivized to move this direction? Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't have a, a good answer. I think that one of the big reasons that I got into this space is because following examples of guys like him, you know, and I, I saw him, what he was doing and putting himself out there and sharing the ideas and, you know, making it more par popular to, for Jason's phrase, you know, farm weird and making you feel, because when you do this stuff, you feel like a village idiot. Right, and I think a lot of people at this conference are probably their own <laughs> village idiots, you know, and uh, you know I I I'm, I know my neighbors drive by and they think I'm absolutely insane. It doesn't make any sense, but farming with an easy bake oven. Yeah, that's right. So, um, <laughs> but I think it, it's going to just take uh, 
more folks that come up with credible solutions that mean something, and it's not just feel good, greenwashing, you know, uh, carbon credit nonsense, but it's something that's actually tangible and works, and that's what, you know, what I'm trying to build is trying to be, you know, as authentic and real and realistic about, you know, this process coming from a conventional space kind of into this, uh, to this other space that's a lot more interesting to me, so. There was always a sign in a restaurant growing up. It, it said, Grandpa says, consider the source. And you, the things that we've talked about, creating value, grabbing more of the pie, building the pie, that's what Farm Weird is, is just to be a facilitator for everyone's ideas. But is, are, is someone gonna talk about epigenetics and the ability to get you know, more yield out of a single seed or, or put things in arrangement to lower our needs for a lot of these inputs? It's not in the best interest of kind of the, the main system here. So a lot of this comes down to the experimentation on your own farm and you got to sell yourself, and then once you sell yourself, you become excited, and then you that now that is the key to open up that connection point with people like Zach to, and, and all the people that it took to get whatever I've built with Muncie Meats. It's 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 just down to relationships, and relationships aren't there unless you're excited about what you're doing, and that begins with. Well, I, I think the other thing I didn't say to that question is you got to create a system that consumers want. You know, and that you know, then then things will follow if there's if there's demand there. And but you've got to have solutions that can scale. And there's still a long way to go, you know, in all this stuff. It's not just going to magically happen overnight. So, go ahead. So you're, are you talking like a 60 inch corn scenario where you would just bring cattle in like in the winter time to, to graze the cover crop? Is that what you're comparing it to? Sure. So no, I haven't made the comparison from an economic standpoint. Like for me, the goal of coming up with this was something that was extremely biodiverse, having more than one one species and something that I could see would fit into uh, be a, a competitive force against the monocrop corn soybean CAFO you know model so uh, have, I haven't made the comparison but it's it's a fair fair question there, there's, I, there's value in both of them I think so yeah this just gives us the ability to cross leverage yeah that, that that's the biggest thing is having to be able to stack enterprises and leverage the benefits that you get from you know growing things in these arrangements i think that's the thing that people don't sometimes understand the stuff that jason can geek out and talk about on two two uh, minute uh, twitter videos uh, that he's he's so good at that's the stuff that i get hooked in this unique arrangement time and space and being able to move things uh, you know in various patterns across the field and when you when you consider a system like that again nothing against it but when me and Zach argue a little bit on how we're going to use these systems I want to probably graze and I got a little bit more warmth than him but I'd like to beat this cover crop down you know every 20 to 25 days and when I did my organic farm and I had a c4 grass out there by by letting it grow you know three feet six times you know I got 18 feet of biomass that was converted into to, to manure and, and roots and it's the ability to not only be doing this but at the same time getting the leverage effect on the edge row and then you add that force multiplier to how much more we could get in the marketplace for sharing that story and how different it is it just kind of adds up and complement each other and the grazing recovery you know, that he's talking about that we argue about sometimes is really predicated on what are the species that you're moving through. If you're going to do hogs, uh, hogs, it takes a lot longer you know, to recover. So my uh, sheep and goats with poultry, uh, boy, within two or, you know, probably two and a half, three weeks with good conditions, we could be back there hitting it again. So it really comes down to what's your mix, how often do you want to move, how often do you want to be coming back across that space. So. Just to give you an idea from an acre space, like it, you know, from like the 20 foot barn and the schematics of being able to graze uh, the same spot twice uh, in a season over a 150 day period, I think I only need like eight tenths of an acre 
uh, for that barn to operate on to generate that type of you know output of animals. So, go ahead. Convenience. And that's why we. What's that? Quality. Quality. Yeah. I think for, for me, I think they want to see something that's uh, uh, more transparent than just what is on a label. You know, that it's all natural. Like they want to see that, and that's one of the things. Like, you know, I, I, there was a post on Facebook uh, this week that the. Uh, the, the liberal whack jobs from California were in Iowa lock up all your hog confinement sites so they can't get in and to me like I want I'd invite them to come every day of the week out to see you know what I'm doing I have nothing to hide and it's um, uh, I want the consumer to be able to see how their protein is being produced from start to finish with absolutely uh, no curtain to, to, to be behind on that I think and I think that's I think people want authenticity you know from that and I, when I've been out in Milwaukee uh, the last couple months designing, we go out to the bars at night in South Milwaukee and tell people about what we're doing. People that have no idea about agriculture or people that maybe are anti a lot of the things that they, they have perceptions on. When we describe what they do, they have a very, very tenable reaction when you explain it and you pull up a video and show this is what we do. It's, there's nothing to hide. And, and we've, I've actually had conversations with the vegans out there that I've gotten to say, you know what, I, I might be willing to eat one of your chickens uh, uh, seeing that. And that's, that's pretty satisfying. So. <laughs> I personally know five vegans that start eating meat without knowing how their food is. Yeah. One of them is in the building. Yeah. 